Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started and as people can roll in, um, I know they can, they, they can continue to join. I'll turn my camera on. Uh, I'm Justin Schell. Welcome everybody to this webinar um, that's presented uh, in partnership between uh, Community Health Mapping as well as the University of Michigan Library. Um, I direct the Shapiro Design Lab at the University of Michigan. Uh, we do a lot of community science, citizen science projects, um, and I was part of a, a group that includes uh, my colleague Tyler Nix from the Taubman Health, Sci Health Sciences Library that brought Kurt to campus last year uh, to do a series of workshops um, around uh, mapping in, uh, in at four different places in, in Southeast Michigan. Um, and so this is the second webinar that we've done this month. Um, last week's webinar was on the basics of QGIS with COVID-19 data. Um, you can find a link to that video, I believe Kurt may share it during this presentation, uh, mm -hmm. but otherwise it'll be available on the CHM blog uh, later. Um, this workshop also will be recorded, um, and so that'll be up uh, either, you know, probably sometime next week. Um, this is a webinar, so just a few logistics. Uh, this is a webinar and not a meeting, so everyone is muted in video and audio by default. Uh, the chat is open and we have a Q&A section, so if you have a specific question, uh, feel free to type it into the Q&A uh, option, which should be on the bottom of your Zoom controls. Um, and we'll try to either try to answer it in there or Kurt, uh, we can have Kurt answer it during the Q&A portion of the, the presentation. Um, and so one, one thing that, um, if you were here at the workshop last week, um, this is definitely more of a demonstration workshop than a, than a sort of hands-on follow along with everything that Kurt's doing on the screen workshop. Um, but again, this will be recorded and you can go back um, and try to and go through all of these different steps on your own devices um, when, uh, when you have more time. Um, other than that, I think, uh, well, at the, uh, the last thing is that we will be sending out a survey. You'll get a survey from Tyler uh, after the, the webinar is concluded uh, to, um, to give us your thoughts on uh, how, the, how the workshop was, as well as your interest in uh, the sort of broader communities of practice that are out there for these kinds of mapping projects. Um, I think that is everything that I would, was going to say for logistics introductions. Um, Tyler, anything you'd want to add? Sounds good. I think we're good. Okay, cool. And with that, I will uh, introduce uh, Kurt Menke from Bird's Eye View GIS, and he's going to go into a little bit longer of an introduction for him. Uh, but if you have questions or issues, please uh, put them in the Q&A or the chat. And thank you again for being here. And Kurt, take it away. All right. Thanks, Justin. Um, hi, everyone. So today I'm going to be talking about collecting data using QGIS and um, an app called Input tied with a plugin called Mergen. So I'm a GIS specialist. I run my own business, Bird's Eye View. I'm also associated with this um, entity called the Q Cooperative. And I've um, been managing the Community Health Maps program for many years. So with all of this, I do a mix of spatial analysis with some cartography and some teaching. Um, I'm a QGIS certified instructor, which means I can offer official QGIS certificates with courses that I teach. I'm a charter member of the Open Source Geospatial Foundation, and I'm a voting member of the QGIS US user group. So there are national QGIS user groups, and um, every group gets one voting member that gets to vote on QGIS issues. Um, and as a sidebar, the QGIS US user group uh, hosted a free online conference last month that took place on three consecutive Fridays, QGIS North America 2020. And it was a free conference organized by volunteers. And all the talks and workshops are available on YouTube. So if you're not aware of it, um, you can go on to this YouTube channel and find um, 20 some odd talks and several workshops that you can watch. I'm also a QGIS author. So most recently, I published QGIS for hydrological applications, recipes for catchment hydrology and water management with a Dutch hydrologist colleague of mine, Hans van der Quast. And before that, I published Discover QGIS 3X, which is a really large 400 page workbook that uh, gives a really thorough treatment of all the capabilities of QGIS from data management to cartography to spatial analysis. And these are um, published through Locate Press and uh, the URL is at the bottom of the slide there. 
the Q Cooperative that I'm associated with is um, kind of an umbrella organization with myself and several QGIS core developers and uh, trainers and kind of power users. And so we offer QGIS support services. So for example, if you needed a custom plugin or a new feature added to QGIS or QGIS server um, or training, that sort of things, so any kind of support, we can provide that. So I wanna shift gears uh, from my introduction to um, talk a little bit about Community Health Maps as a program and, and what it is in case you're not aware. So it's a project of the National Library of Medicine and I've been helping run this for about 10 years now. Um, so NLM, if you're not aware of it, is part of the US National Institutes of Health. And within NLM, which is the, the US's biggest biomedical research li library, um, there was a division of specialized information services and they had an outreach and special populations branch. And their mission was to seek to improve access to quality and accurate health information to um, underserved and minority populations in the US. And I say was because there's been some big changes recently. So after over the last year, the National Library of Medicine has been reorganized and that division of specialized information services no longer exists. So this community health maps program that was born in that division and, and, and operated out of it no longer fits into any of the program areas at NLM. So with that, NLM is ceasing support for the community health maps program starting next month in September 2020. And this program is being transferred to what they call community funded support. So with this, uh, there's a new website for this program. It's been moved from the nlm.nih.gov domain to a .org domain. So bookmark this new site. This is, has all the original material uh, from the other site and the blog and other things will, will live on on this new .org site. So um, this is the very last CHM funded um, webinar. And so on September 21st next month, this will be an unfunded project. And so I, I, I'm really, this, this program is near and dear to my heart. It's um, done a lot of good and serves a really valuable uh, purpose, I think. And so I would like to um, keep it going. So if anyone knows of you know, grant opportunities or if anyone would like to um, sponsor a workshop or host a workshop, that sort of thing, uh, please get in touch with me. So the goal of Community Health Maps itself is really, really empowerment, to empower community organizations with mapping technology. And we focus specifically on communities with vulnerable populations, minority populations, and those that um, frequently, and use collect you know, frequently use and collect data. And so they need some kind of mapping solution, but they usually lack resources for proprietary GIS licenses or training. And so with NLM support, we've been able to go into communities and provide free training for, for years now and, and show people how to use open source alternatives. So what we do usually is go in and give presentations, um, half day to full day long workshops showing how to use various mapping tools. We usually use the train the trainer method where we invite people who are leaders in their communities to come to the workshop and then they can then pass their knowledge on once they re return to their community. Um, since we're only face to face with people for a limited time, we have um, a blog that I'll, and lab exercises and I'm also available for consultation. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those near the end of the webinar. But again, the, it's this mission to empower people with um, the ability to collect and manage their own geospatial data to help their own communities. And so the, the National Library of Medicine or this program has never had any interest in um, managing people's data for them or having any ownership in that. We're just there to show people how to use tools essentially. So in a typical workshop, we cover field data collection um, like we're gonna do today. These pictures are all from a workshop I did in American Samoa last fall. We also cover desktop analysis and cartography and web mapping. So today we're gonna to be focused on um, some QGIS related data collection apps. And so QGIS is the leading free and open source desktop GIS, runs on all the major operating systems. It's very intuitive, reads and writes all the common formats. So um, you don't get yourself into a black box. You can 
work with um, data that was produced in Esri software, for example. Um, so the data can come in back and forth. It reads a honestly a silly number of file formats, which is a really big strength. Um, has powerful analysis tools and some state-of-the-art cartographic tools as well. So we'll see um, a little bit of this today. And uh, so last week I walked through one case study um, that we used in, um, community health maps for down in Miami, Florida with the King Tide data. So today I'm gonna, um, we're gonna show you some work that's been done with community health maps in Honolulu, Hawaii and Seattle, Washington. So one of the first pilots we had for this whole methodology, this whole program was at the University of Hawaii at their John Burns School of Medicine and they have a Department of Native Hawaiian Health. So we were working with the Native Hawaiian communities on Oahu and they were interested in doing some obesity studies. So they wanted to do what they called a kind of a windshield survey of their neighborhoods for factors that could contribute to obesity on one side or the other. So healthy alternatives um, versus, you know, poor food choices and things like that. So we did a one day train the trainer training and we um, first showed them how to use QGIS to create the survey area. So there were gonna be eight native Hawaiian communities that were gonna participate. And so they were interested in working from a mile within the center of that community. So we buffered all those communities by a mile in QGIS to create the extent of their field data collection efforts. And this is a map of the first weekend's work out there in the Kahala neighborhood and people from the community came out and used their smartphones to collect exercise opportunities, did a survey of what's available in various grocery stores and restaurants and things like that. So kind of mapping um, all the different choices that could contribute to obesity in one way or another. Another um, early pilot we did was with the Urban Indian Health Institute in Seattle. So they focus on urban Indian populations in the US and they were interested in the chronic health effects from noise pollution. So again, we did the same kind of one day train the trainer training and they went out and surveyed Native American neighborhoods in Seattle and they were specifically interested in mapping noise. So the cool thing about collecting data with a smartphone is that there's an app for that. And so at the time, this was several years ago, they found uh, a noise meter app for the iPhone SPLN FFT, and they did some sensitivity training with it they, to see how well it worked, uh, tried different microphones with their phones, and they developed a whole data collection protocol where they would measure sound at, in neighborhoods um, throughout the day and throughout the week. And so then they were able to start putting together maps after the first weekend like this, where they have all their noise points um, colored by the decibel reading. So this is a map that they created, and then they brought in some per capita income to do some hypothesis testing to see what they could do. So this was um, the very first map that they ever produced. So today we're gonna talk about some of that data collection, and we're gonna focus on, um, talk about two apps and work with one in particular. So both QField and Input um, have more in common than, than differences. They're um, both related to QGIS. They're both um, freely available apps and um, both companies are doing great work. And I, I hesitated to add a feature comparison on here because both of these apps are evolving so rapidly that by next month, my comparison chart would be out of date probably. So, um, we're gonna focus on input today, just in the interest of time. Um, input is produced by a company in the United Kingdom called Lutra Consulting, and QField is produced by a Swiss company, opengis.ch. And so you can find both of these online, and I'm, I'm big fans of both. We're just covering one in the interest of time. Um, and the, the, this is a nice change for community health maps because typically these mapping technologies, um, especially the ones that are available for both iOS and Android cost had licensing fees associated with them that were kind of prohibitive for a lot of communities. So the nice thing about both of these is that they are free apps that you can use you know, free of charge. And since we can use all the power of QGIS behind them, um, it makes a really nice package. So this is what some screenshots of input on a phone look like, where you can have several projects here. 
you can um, you know, bring, bring in different maps and it will honor the, the symbology that you created in QGIS. You're actually importing your QGIS map document and data onto your phone. And um, then you can collect data and, and kind of see a, a questionnaire up here that you've created in QGIS to um, collect data into as you go. So this um, input has another companion piece called Mergen. So Mergen is a couple things. It's a cloud service, so you can log into um, cloud.mergen and create a free account. And so you, it stores your data. It can also manage versions of your data as it goes through changes. And it allows you to share QGIS projects. It's also a QGIS plugin. So here you're seeing the layers, the browser panel in QGIS. And by right clicking on the Mergen um, provider here, you um, see your Mergen projects. You can also explore um, other projects that are publicly available or those that have been shared with you. So this plugin allows you to basically sync your QGIS document with the Mergen cloud. And then you can bring it into input. So it's kind of the go-between. So this maybe makes a little more sense. Where we're gonna start is developing a project in QGIS. We're then gonna use Mergen to push it up to the cloud. And then I'm gonna get onto my phone and we're gonna download it onto the phone and collect some data. And then we're gonna use Mergen as again as the go-between to pass that back to QGIS and see the results. So you can, you can just um, continuously use this Mergen um, service to, to pass the data back and forth. So today I'm gonna to be working with um, QGIS 314. There are some new features in 314 um, that I'll be using, so, but most of what I would be showing will also work in um, the long-term release, which is 310 at the moment. Um, to do what I'm gonna be doing, you'd need to set up a Mergen account at public.cloudmergen.com. And then you need to install the Mergen plugin um, in QGIS, which is free. And then um, install the input app on your phone. So this one is available for both um, Android and Apple. The other app I mentioned, QField, currently is Android only, but they are, I mean, I, I even at, by the time I record this, I might be wrong. I think they're, they're working very quickly on getting this available for Apple, that one too. So um, in very short order, they will both be available on both platforms. So let me, um, with that, um, get into this demo and show you how this works. So I'm gonna get out of this uh, PowerPoint presentation and I'm gonna bring up QGIS. And we're gonna start with a, a, an empty project and just build it up. So we're not gonna start with any, any data. What I'm gonna do first is um, add some base maps here. And so I'm going to use the Quick Map Services plugin to add first the Google hybrid base map, which is uh, satellite imagery. And I'm going to, instead of looking at the whole world, I'm gonna to go to a bookmark that I have for my neighborhood here. And so we're gonna be working in my neighborhood. And um, so we're zoomed into that part of Albuquerque, New Mexico here. So I'm then gonna go back to the Quick Map Services plugin and I'll add an open street map base map. So here we have, um, the Google hybrid and below that, the OSM standard. So we can, I'll show you um, how we can work with both of these base maps in um, QGIS and input. So what I'm gonna do next is create a survey layer. And I'm gonna do a survey that, um, so if you've attended previous community health maps workshops and perhaps worked with apps like Fulcrum, where you created a data collection form online with this workflow, we're gonna be using QGIS to develop that data collection form. And then we're gonna be uploading the project to the Merge in Cloud and then downloading it to our phone. So that's a slightly different workflow than you would have done in a previous uh, workshop. So I'm gonna to go to the layer menu and create layer. And I'm gonna create a new geo package layer. And the reason I'm choosing geo package is that Mergen, the, the website, will manage versions if you're using a geo package. You can also use shape files, but um, be a little slicker to use a geo package here. So I'm, I'm naming my geo package CHM for community health maps, and my table name is going to be survey. And I'm going to make this a point layer. And I'm going to put it in the same coordinate system as my base maps. 
And I'm going to add a couple of fields um, as I create this point layer. So the first field I'm going to create is going to be called name. And this is going to be a survey that again mimics the, the questionnaire, the survey questionnaire that um, the University of Michigan has put together for this webinar that you'll get. So this will be a, a chance for the person to enter their name. So this will be text data. Add it to the fields. Then I'm going to add a second one called photo where you can take a photo of yourself. This will also be text. You'll see how that works in a little bit. The next one is gonna be date to record the current date when the point was collected. This will be a date and time column. And then a fourth one will be one called a name here. And this will be a question, how did you hear about this webinar? So I'll make this text data as well. So with that I will click okay and we'll have an empty point layer added to QGIS. So the next thing we're gonna do is do some quick styling to this. So when you add a layer to QGIS, it comes in with random symbology. So we have a, a simple purple marker here, and I'm gonna change that using this layer styling panel to um, something that looks more like a target. So I'm gonna um, use this plus marker, and I'm going to uh, make it a little bigger. and a, th a thicker line, and I'll change it to um, a bright orange color. Now I'm gonna hit this green plus to add a second simple marker to this symbol, and I'm gonna give this point um, a transparent fill, and I'll give it the same color as the plus, and I'm going to, again, make it thicker and bump up the size a little bit. So now we kind of have this target kind of icon here. And let's see. So um, the next thing, excuse me while I look at my notes so I don't forget anything. Um, QGIS has these things called widgets that a lot of casual users probably have never noticed or ignored. Um, so if I open up the layer properties for my survey layer, um, there's a fields tab where I can see the, the fields that I've added to this la layer. Oh, and it looks like, um, huh, I forgot to click um, add to fields list when I add it here. Um, I do that sometimes. So I'm just going to add it here. So I'm going to click edit and um, hit the add new field button. And I'll add that here column right now, which is going to again be text. Okay, so now we have it. open this back up again. So we have our four columns and I'm going to switch to this attributes form column. And this is where I can um, set up what's called widgets, which is basically how these um, different questions will behave when we're looking at our smartphone collecting data. So when we create something in a geo package format, we get this FID, which is a feature ID, and we don't really need to be concerned with that. So I can assign a widget type of hidden to that so it's not seen. For the name um, and for all of these that I'm going to use, I can enter an alias. So here for an alias for this, I can um, type enter your name. And this will just be straight text. And if I want this to be a required field that they have to enter, I'll check the not null box. And uh, since I'll be collecting data today, I could put my own name as the default value. So I could type my name down here in the default section, which is what the, it'll default to when I bring up this form on the phone. It's giving me a little error message. I have to enter text in single ticks. There we go. So now I've set up the, uh, the name column. The next one will be photo. And for this one, I'm gonna, as an alias type, take a selfie. And instead of being a text edit, this is going to be an attachment since it's gonna be a photograph. And um, this also has to work on the phone. So with um, photos, it's always good to set the uh, relative paths. It just helps the, um, the phone and QGIS both find the photo that's collected. And I'm gonna scroll down in this um, widget type column to the bottom where we have this integrated document viewer and I'm gonna set the type to image. So it's gonna be an image attachment. 
and I'll set this to not null as well. And then for the date, I don't need an alias for this. It's going to be collected automatically. Um, but there is um, a default format for the date, and I can I can change that though. I could go down here and choose custom, and um, let me bring up my notes here and copy and paste this. So with dates in QGIS, you can um, use the YYY, MM, DD, HH, minute, seconds to configure how that date is going to appear. So here I'm going to use this expression, which puts it kind of into an American format with the month spelled out, and the day, comma, year. Um, it's not the way they would do it in Europe, but it's the way it's done in, in the US. So I'm going to change that up here. And um, let me just um, show you how some of this is working already. So if I um, get out of layer properties and I put this layer into edit mode and add a point to my map. Um, this is the form that would come up to fill out. And for the date, if I click this drop down, you'll see there's this little calendar pop up. So that's an example of a date widget. And um, so if I just, you know, click OK and put that point there and open the attribute table, the attribute table for date will also have that same calendar pop up. So these widgets can be useful even if you're not doing data collection just to set up your data in a more intelligent, user-friendly way. So I'm going to um, get out of edit mode and discard that. I don't want to collect that point. That was just an example. And I'll reopen to finish up setting up these widgets. So with this um, date column, that default calendar pop-up is checked. I don't really want that. I'm just going to uncheck that. Um, I've set the custom format for it. I'll set it to not null, so it's required. And down here, there's also this um, default section where I entered my name for name. I, there's also variables and functions that um, QGIS has. So if there's one, for example, that's really handy here called dollar now. And if I put that in, it's going to auto populate with the current time and date. The last one is here, and this will be. Let's see, how did you hear about this webinar? And this will just be a text edit. I'll also make this one required. Okay, so I've set up my data. I'm gonna um, save my project as well. I'm gonna put it into um, the same folder that contains my geo package. And I'll call it CHM demo. And the next thing I want to show is um, there's a feature of QGIS called map themes that we can use to provide basically different maps when we're out collecting data on our phone. So here, for example, we have um, the open street map base map and we have the satellite image and we can't use them both at the same time. But what I can do is click this little eye icon on the layers panel and tell it here to add a theme. And I have my OpenStreetMap and my survey data on. So I can call this the OSM, OpenStreetMap theme. And if I toggle that off and toggle on the Google hybrid base map, I can add another theme and call this satellite. People also use this to create offline and online base map. So if you're out of cellular coverage, you could create an off online, uh, I mean, offline um, theme that has tiles associated with it. So for, I'm not going to show that here, but there are um, a new feature called vector tiles. So you can create a, some vector tiles or raster tiles as well um, to use and then set those as a map theme for an offline data collection situation. Um, but for this, I will just set each of these online base maps as its own theme. So I've gone and saved my project. And now I'm going to go to the browser panel and I see the, the merge in plugin here, which I've installed. This is where it appears. And I'm going to right click on my projects and tell merge in to create a new project. So I'll call this CHM demo. And I'm going to initialize this from the local drive. And to do that, I'm going to point it to the folder that has both the project and the geo package in it. I could also make this public if I wanted to, but for this, I'm just going to keep it 
uh, private and click OK. So right now it's uploading my project to the Mergen cloud. So it's uploaded it successfully. So now I should be able to get onto my phone. I'm gonna to switch to my projects and I'll see now a download link for CHM demo since I have synchronized that to the cloud. So I'll download the project to my phone, go back to home and open that project. Now, if I click on the three dots in the more section, you can see there's a map themes setting and I can use that to switch between OSM and satellite. So here's the satellite theme. Here's the OSM theme. And if I want to record my location, I can go and click the record button. I'll see that the survey layer is the one layer that is editable and I'll click the add point button. And I can see it's defaulted to my name since I set that as the default. I can take a photo. And how did I hear about this webinar? I'll say Twitter. Click done and save my point. So what I'll do now is go back to my projects and I can see there's now a refresh icon next to the CHM demo project because I've made changes to it. So I'll click that to sync this back up with the cloud. And now I'm gonna go back to QGIS and I'm going to right click on my CHM demo project in the Mergen plugin and tell it to synchronize. So it'll download the data from the cloud. It's done that successfully. And now if I pan, I should see my point appear right here. So I'm gonna use the identify tool to see the data that I just collected. And you can see the information, my name, the picture, the date, how, to, how I heard about the workshop. And this is the normal table view of the identify window but you'll notice this little button up here that says view feature form. And if I click that, I'll actually view the form that I created um, in, the, in the layer properties. This same form view is available in attribute tables too. So if I open up the attribute table for this layer, this is the standard row column format and I'll see my alias appear as the headers. But down in the lower right hand corner, there's an option to put a table into form view. And if I do that, I'll see the form view for the one record that I've collected. So now what I'm gonna do is um, add a few more fields to this layer. So I'm gonna double click on survey. So I'll put the layer in edit mode and I'll click the add new field button. And this next field is gonna be called your experience. And I'm gonna use this to rank the experience from one to 10. So I'm gonna make this a whole number. The next column I'm gonna call future web. And this will be used to store information about whether you'd like to attend a future webinar. So the answer is gonna be yes or no, and I'll make that Boolean. And the last field I'll add here will be called topics. And I'll use this to record what future topics you'd like to hear. So I'll make this text. So I'll save my edits. reopen this and I'll open up uh, layer properties again and go to the attributes form. And for your experience, this is again to rate your experience. So I'm gonna put in an alias here, rate your experience. And this is gonna be a range, a numeric range, but I'm gonna make the input a slider. So the user will be able to put a slide, a slider from one to 10 in steps of one to rate the webinar. And I'll also check this not null. Um, there's another option down here, dial, which would create a dial, but I'm gonna use the slider here. For future webinars, the alias is gonna be, I will participate in future events. This is gonna be Boolean, so I'm just gonna leave it as the default checkbox, but I'll check the not null to make sure that it's a required field. And for topics, 
I'm going to have an alias of I'd like to see more of. And instead of the default text edit for a text field, I'm going to set this to a value map. And this allows me to enter different values that would be seen in a pick list. So value one would be um, perhaps QGIS. Another choice with a value of two would be, um, let's see, data collection. Another choice with a value of three might be web mapping. So the usual user will be able to choose from those three topics for future webinars. And again, I'll make this not null. Like I could set a default, but I'll leave that blank and I'll click apply. And I'm going to um, save my project. So now I'll switch to the browser window and I'll right click in the merge in plug in on this project and I'll tell Mergen to synchronize this. So it gets pushed up to the cloud with my latest edits. And now I'm gonna get back on my phone. And if I go to my projects and refresh that, I'll see that there's a refresh button next to CHM demo indicating the changes that have been pushed up. So I'll download the most recent version, go to home and open this project. So now what I can do is um, collect another point. And let's say this time I'm pretending that um, Tyler Nix is visiting in town, listening in the neighborhood. So I will take a photo. How did he hear about this webinar? Let's say email. There's a slider now, so I can um, slide to slider. So Tyler's having a great experience. He rates it as an eight. He will participate in future events and he'd like to see more of web mapping. So I can click save. Another thing I can do since I've added new questions, I can click on this previous point that I collected and click the edit button and go back in here and um, change some of my answers. We can rate the experience. I will participate in future events and I'd like to see more about QGIS. So I can click save. So now I have two points collected. I'm going to go back to projects, to my project, and I'll again see that there have been changes. So I will refresh this so it gets uploaded to the merge in cloud. And I'm going to bring QGIS back up. So I'm going to right click on my project in the merge in section of the browser, download the, rate, the most recent edits. And I'm going to browse or pan rather, and you'll see now there's two points here. So if I uh, click identify on this point that I just collected and put it into form mode, you can see that's the Tyler Nix entry there. And on my point that I or originally collected, you can see that my revised answers for the extra questions have been added. The other thing I wanted to show with this is this drag and drop designer. This is another thing that a lot of people probably don't realize is there, but it's really nice for these data collection forms. So right now I've set up widgets for each of these, which is great. Um, but I can also switch it to this drag and drop designer, which allows me to um, basically set up different tabs and organize questions. So um, first off, I can maybe get rid of FID on here because I don't need that. And I can hit the green plus button and I could add a tab called about you. And I could drag the name information, name question, the photo, the date, and here as all part of being about you. And I could click a second one um, and call it this webinar. And I could um, drag these other questions that are more about the webinar down into this tab. Oops, make sure they land on it. There. 
and click OK. And this, this, the way this would look on the phone is if I again put this into edit mode and add another point, you'll see that I have, now have tabs that divide the questions up. And this is the same way it would look on the phone if I was able to show you that a little bit better. So um, that's you know, the nuts and bolts of how it works um, between QGIS and input. I'm going to um, open up a new project that I already have saved that takes us a little further. And it has another very similar point layer. But this one has a few more questions added and the drag and drop designer has been set up to have questions about you, your work, and this webinar. So what I'm going to do is um, go to the merge and plug in and I'm going to right click and create a new project from this and I'm going to call this CHM input webinar and I'm going to initialize this from the local drive and I'm going to point it to the folder that contains this other project and I'm going to make this public. So I'll click OK. and click close. So this is one that you should now be able to find in the explore section. Um, I want to spend a little time showing you the, the Mergin website too, because we haven't looked at that yet. So this is the actual Mergin website where you go and you create your account and your, your projects are managed. So if I um, refresh this, I'll see the, the new projects that I have created. So CHM demo that I've been working with and CHM input webinar. So for demo, if I enter this project, um, I can go over here and look at track changes. And you can see the different changes that I've made. And you can actually look at different versions of this project. So it actually does version control and lets you download um, individual versions of this project at different stages. Um, if I go back to the one called um, webinar that has a fuller set of questions. You can see um, when you upload a folder to Mergen, it takes everything in that folder. So it takes my QGIS project file and the geo package that I had and uploads that. Um, I'm also able to just use Mergen to download this project. I could clone it and make a copy of it, basically. I can transfer it to someone else. So I could transfer ownership to another user. And if I go into project settings, this is where I can add other users. So for example, um, I could add Tyler Nix as one of the users of this project, click add. And then I can set permissions for what he's able to do. I, maybe I don't want him to be owner, but I want him to be able to collect data. In other words, write. Um, you can also delete users from this um, and up at the top, you can actually delete the whole project if you want to. So that's um, how the Mergin website works itself. It has a lot of um, rapidly advanced, advanced uh, rapidly developing functionalities for version control and managing projects that are really handy. Um, let's see. So for example, people could, um, get into Mergen and, and go through and explore and look for the CHM input webinar project, you could download it via Mergen to QGIS and you could collect data and you could complete the survey via um, QGIS and Mergen if you wanted to. So um, you um, are welcome to do that going forward. I know this is all kind of fast to, to have done it on the fly. Um, and I want to finish up with just showing you a, a couple of resources that are available to you. So I'm going to get back into my PowerPoint. First off, um, there's a podcast called Mapscaping that I'm a big fan of. And um, I was interviewed on the Mapscaping podcast back in May about both Q field and input. So if you like podcasts um, and mapping, this is a great one. And this, in, this episode might be interesting because we talk about both Q field and input in a 45 minute discussion or so. 
Um, I also have a blog post up on the community health map site on using input and merging in QGIS for field data collection. So you can also visit that. This was written last fall. Most of it still holds true. Um, so the blog itself is a place where I can keep people abreast of um, new advances in mapping technology. So there's the, the most recent one is from the webinar last week on how to create a COVID-19 animation using the QGIS temporal controller. And there's a lot of case studies up there. So the case studies I started out with today are all described on the blog. So you can, things are tagged up there so you can search for those and read about some of those projects if you're interested. Um, a reminder that there's also lab exercises up on the community health map site. So there's a series of six exercises. The field data collection one that's up there now is um, set up to use Fulcrum. I'll be probably updating that to use both QField and input um, this fall. Um, the others work on um, working with QGIS, doing spatial analysis, making maps, and doing data visualization exercises. So these are all self-paced labs with um, data that you can download and, and go through um, at your own pace. There's also a, an online tutorial that is basically the um, mimics a face-to-face -face four hour workshop. And you can use this to get continuing education credits through the Medical Library Association. Um, the tutorial isn't quite set up on the new page. I have a little bit more work to do, but that should be up in the next couple of weeks. And um, I'd like to finally just thank the whole team that helped put these two webinars together, the COVID-19 one last week and this one, Tyler Nix, Justin Schell, Marissa Conti, and Alexandra Rivera. So this was definitely a team effort and uh, really helped to have their support to put this together. Last week's QGIS and COVID-19 webinar has just landed on YouTube, so I'll leave this link up there. I will put this up on the QGIS, um, or on the uh, Community Health Maps blog. So you, you, this, this webinar and last week's, will, will, the links will be up on the website for you to find. Um, this is also closed captioned, so that should be nice. And with that, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Cool, thanks, Kurt. Um, I just posted the YouTube link in the, in the chat as well. Um, so a few different questions came in. Um, I'll start with something in the chat. Um, so with, with the, um, the input app, um, could you have more than one person like contribute to the same project with different accounts or does, it, does the project have to be just one person's account? Um, everyone, I believe, has to have an account, but the accounts are free. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and, and then once I have an account, like I, like Tyler set up an account and I shared this project with him. So that, that's kind of the way it would work. You can share a project with multiple data collectors and then they can all basically be putting their same data into that same bucket, if you will, the same geo package. And, um, you can use the version control, um, on Mergent to handle those. So you can, um, you know, you could reject some, some entries and things like that if you needed to. Okay, great. Um, and then are you going to have, I think you mentioned this at the end, but just to be sure, um, a step, sort of a step-by-step -step handout for this process as part of the, the CHM blog. So the things you, you demonstrated today. Yeah, I think I need to update some of it. Um, the, the blog post I, I highlighted um, from last fall covers a lot of what I went through today. So people should look at that. Um, it covers how to set up, uh, use, use the widgets, how to, um, establish map themes, how to use the merge and plugin and all of that and, and the input app. So um, most of that is documented, but I will update it with some, some of the new features. Great, cool, thanks. Um, so John asks, how do I use value relation and in input for data collection? Is there a resource that I can refer to? I believe value relation is uh, on the QGIS documentation. So if you go online to the, the QGIS website to documentation, you should be able to find um, information on value relations. I know that's been discussed. I, I, ha I myself haven't used it in a while, so I, I forget how it actually works, but um, I know it's documented because I've seen, I've seen that. Okay. Um, can you recommend a site where setting up offline themes is explained? Uh, yeah, actually, um, 
I believe that my, my co-author on the QGIS hydrological book, Hans van der Quast, has a YouTube channel. So if you search YouTube for Hans van der Quast, you will find his YouTube channel. And I believe he has um, a video showing how to use um, raster tiles to set up offline data. Um, that's one of the things that I will probably cover in an updated blog post as well. Um, okay. It's not difficult. There's basically um, some processing algorithms in the toolbox. One is for vector tiles and one is for raster tiles. So if you simply search the toolbox for tiles, that keyword, you'll find the algorithms to create those. And y you know, you have to do a little bit of, um, you have to decide how much, how big you want your project file to be because those um, tiles, if you have a very large study area and you want a lot of detail, you, you basically set the, you know, like Google Maps, for example, has a scale from one to 20 and or something like that. And so if you, 20 being the most fine and the, the larger number of tiles, and if you try to do a large area at, at scale 20, it'll be a huge file. So you have to do a little bit of experimenting with um, necessary level to do your work and um, appropriate file sizes to, to upload and download the, the data back and forth. Um, but the, the tool is easy to use. It creates a local MB tiles file that you can um, just add to the layers panel and use like a base map. And I think that, and so uh, Hans just put a link uh, to that video um, and also a step-by-step -step tutorial into the chat. Oh, thanks, well. Hans. Um, and and uh, yeah, so you can also find this. This someone else asked about the spelling. Um, if you look in the chat, you'll see that, and you'll see the the uh, the specific titles and things like that. Um, I think that also answered the question about using input offline. Um, Jonathan asks, "What is the advantage of input uh, regarding ODK?" Oh, let's see. Um... I don't, I haven't used ODK in about a year, so maybe it's changed a little bit, but I think input is just a little easier to use. And um, it's, um, yeah, o ODK collect is, is, is great, but it's a, a little clunky. And I think the advantage of, um, if you're gonna be working with QGIS, um, there are big advantages to using either Q field or input because um, they, they both have plugins that allow you to transfer the data directly back into QGIS. And uh, that isn't the case with ODK Collect. Um, both these apps will also honor the symbology and the maps you've created in QGIS and your, they will look the same on your phone as they do in QGIS. And so it's just uh, kind of part of the QGIS ecosystem at that point and makes it a little more seamless and easy to work with. Um, you can still, you know, nothing against ODK Collect, it's just not set up to do exactly that. Okay. Um, and another question was, um, is, is not null constraint supported by input? Uh, they tried to add a point and could not submit it um, without anything. Yeah, if you, if you have not null checked, then you have to answer the question in order to save the point. Okay. Yeah. So it's basically, when you, when you check not null, it's basically making it a required question. Got it. Um, but that's, that's all the questions in the Q&A in the chat. Um, if there's nothing else, uh, I'll thank everyone again for coming today. Um, the recording will be available sometime next week. We'll send a link to it uh, with, with everyone. It'll be on YouTube as well as on the CHM blog. Um, keep an eye out for uh, the um, survey from Tyler that'll be coming soon. Oh, one more question just came in. Is it possible to work on QGIS and collect dates at the same time on the same project? So the synchronization will work across uh, those different uh, data collection aspects? I believe so. I, I, I don't usually work with it that way. I usually upload my project, you know, collect the data and then and sync it back. But the, I believe the synchronization should work both directions, um, but I honestly haven't tried it. Okay. Um, okay, well, uh, something else? Uh, thanks again, and uh, we will see you sometime, uh, maybe on another webinar, sometime in 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 the future. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks everybody.